Have you ever wanted God to move in your life? To watch him show up and witness his power? Then it's time to prepare. We can learn to get ready for him to move. God's power doesn't fall randomly or haphazardly. It falls after his people have prepared. And it's still true today. It's time to start preparing for God's power. Well, hi, everyone. For three weeks, we've been talking about the coming showdown between Elijah and his God, the God of Israel, and the evil king and queen, Ahab and Jezebel, and their false prophets and their false gods on the top of Mount Carmel. The, the people are in the middle of a three and a half year drought. And we're going to spend the duration of our time today on the top of that mountain as Elijah calls an entire nation to revival and renewal, a nation who had shifted their worship to the idols of the enemy. Now, as we've seen, this moment of tremendous power where fire is about to fall from heaven didn't come out of the blue. God had been preparing Elijah for three and a half years for this moment. Elijah's preparation included some scheduled time and hiding at the brook of Kareth where he was broken and miraculously fed by the ravens so that God could teach Elijah total dependence. Then the brook dried up and God moved Elijah to the widow's house in Zarephath where God took Elijah to the school of faith as he performed miracles with the flour and oil and the resurrection of the young boy. And there he learned to take little steps of great faith. And last week, Pastor Scott shared the encounter between Elijah and Obadiah and ultimately Ahab, where he learned to proceed with bold obedience. And today, in week four, we're going to learn to risk it all. Today, Elijah pushes his chips to the middle. And so my big idea today is the fullness of God's power will only show up when you risk it all. And listen, without all the preparations, Elijah would, have been, would not have been ready to do this. Like without all of the, that God had been teaching him, he wouldn't be ready for this moment. And so we, we've said since the beginning of the series that God's fire doesn't fall haphazardly. It doesn't fall randomly. It falls where preparations have been made. And so God had prepared Elijah for this moment. So as we prepare, as a church, as we prepare for an outpouring of power from Almighty God, we pray in the months and years ahead for us, as you prepare for God to show up in your individual life, in your family, in your workplace, in your ministry, in your relationships, even in your own heart, my question for all of us is this. Is the altar of your heart prepared? for God's power to come? Have you learned the lessons that we've been talking about, lessons of total dependence? Are you passing the small tests that lead to great faith? Are you being bold in your obedience day to day? These preparations act as the, the kindling that will help to ignite the fire of God's power in our midst. I've heard from so many people saying, I'm ready, you know, I'm ready for God to do something. I'm ready to hit the reset button of my life. I'm ready for renewal and to give God my whole heart. Let me just say that as we get ready to learn from this showdown, that, that above everything else in our lives, God wants that too. He wants renewal. He wants first place in our hearts. He wants all of our worship. He wants all of our focus. He wants all of our adoration. It's how he designed this life to work. Remember the very first of the Ten Commandments. Commandment number one, God says, you shall have no other gods before me. When Jesus was questioned, what's the most important commandment? Jesus said, above all else, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So when God and Jesus both say in unity, this is the number one thing, our ears and our hearts better perk up, which also gives good reason. If, if you're Satan, for example, if you're an enemy of God, what would you try to do to hurt God? Well, you would try to take the hearts of the people away from the one true God. You would try to distract God's people. You would try to get them to focus on other gods, on false gods, which is something that Satan's been doing for as long as he's been slithering around the earth, putting false gods in the place of the one true God. It's called the sin of idolatry. And that's what Elijah is confronting today. So let's go to the top of Mount Carmel. I'm just going to kind of walk us through the text today. And, and as we go, we're going to draw four lessons from the showdown at Mount Carmel. So look at 1 Kings uh, chapter 18, verse 20. It says this, And Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, 
then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Now we pick up here where Pastor Scott left us hanging last week. Elijah puts out the call for renewal, for people to go all in. And then there's an awkward silence. He says, you're wavering. You're not fully committed to God. You're not, you know, you're not fully committed to the Baal either. You're limping along between the two. And Elijah comes along and he says, listen, you're, you're sitting on the fence. How long are we going to play this game with one foot in the world and one foot in the church and pretend that everything is just fine? How long are you going to deliberate about whether God is really enough for you? Elijah says, it's decision time. And listen, if you're someone today who, who sometimes worships God, but sometimes you worship what makes you happy in the moment, and sometimes you worship climbing the corporate ladder, and sometimes you worship your political party, and sometimes you worship the latest cause, and sometimes you worship yourself and your reputation, I, I would just echo Elijah's sentiments today and say, w would you just choose? Like, choose, and then follow it all the way to its logical conclusion so you can see if it's going to be for real. Most people I know aren't worshiping the false gods of Baal or, or Asherah. You're worshiping the things that I just mentioned. Oddly enough, it could also be your children. Like I see a lot of parents today worshiping their children. The kids' desires, the kids' involvements, the kids' schedules take precedent over just about every other family priority, including church and spiritual things. So these other things in our lives that creep into the driver's seat, they start becoming the focus of our time and of our energy and attention and money. And when they unseat God, they become idols. So here's Elijah's first lesson from the top of Mount Carmel as he addresses the wayward people of Israel, that only God is worthy of risking it all. Look at verse 21. I just want you to help me out here. Elijah says that if the Lord is God, then what does he say? He says, yeah, follow him. And, and, and if Baal is God, then what? Follow him. So he's saying, listen, pick your God and then go all in. Then risk it all with that God. But stop wavering between the two. You have to choose. And I think if Elijah were here today, he would say the same thing. Quit wavering. I mean, you want to say, you know, God, keep me out of hell and get me into heaven. But, but I still want to do whatever I want. Oh, God, hear my pr prayer and bless me. But I don't want to obey any of your commandments. Oh, oh God, I, I want all of your good things, but, but I don't want to stop my bad things. Quit wavering. Quit being a Christian on Sunday and a pagan on Monday. Quit claiming Christ and living like you don't know him. Like if you're going to follow your false gods, well, then follow them all the way. But stop pretending. Like if money is your God, then what would it look like to serve money with all your heart? Like, like you would get money any way you could. If you had to cheat to do it, I mean, if it's the ultimate good, then sacrifice everything to attain more of it. Sacrifice your family, sacrifice your integrity, never give any of it away in generosity. I mean, if money is your God, imagine what it would look like to go all in with money. Or if pleasing people, for example, is your God, then what would it look like to go all in with pleasing people? Like you'd be a, a sellout. Do whatever you need to do in order to earn people's approval. Put others down, gossip about people, slander people, say yes to everything they ask you to do. Just please away. But, but then ask yourself, is that the life I want? So like if beauty and your appearance is your God, go to the logical conclusion. Like serve it all the way. Nip it and tuck it and lift it and tighten it and tan it and tweak it and twist it and tat it and pierce it and puff it and color it. Whatever you need to do. And make sure all your social posts are perfectly staged and filtered. Spend inordinate, inordinate amounts of time and money on gym memberships and diets and doing whatever it takes to get noticed. Or if like sex is your God, just go all the way with it. If, if you need to be unfaithful to your spouse, go for it. If you need to forget all your responsibilities to your kids and find some good sex out there, hey man, make all your fantasies come true. If you feel like your best sex partner happens to be married to your best friend, who cares? Go all in. Elijah says, if these bales are your God, then follow them all the way. But here's the thing. Thousands of years of history have proven that these things aren't able to provide ultimate meaning and purpose for a human life. So many people from so many generations have tried this approach and they've come up empty. And if they can't provide ultimate meaning, why are you trifling with them? Why are you spending your precious time and energy pursuing them? Because there's only one true God. And you can serve him with all your heart. So go all in. As the great Charles Spurgeon said, if you're going to be saved, be saved all the way. See, most Christians are trying to be a little into the world and a little into God. But they're enough into the world 
to be miserable in God. And they're enough into God to be miserable in the world. Let's go all in. Christianity is a terrible hobby. It's an, it's an annoying thing to dabble with. Like you have to get up on Sunday, you have to sit in a big room where people ask you to volunteer and give some money and then a guy gets up and yells at you for a half hour. Like what a waste of a perfectly good Sunday morning if you're not all in. And the other option, the one that many of you have discovered is that if you do push your chips into the middle, if you say, I'm all in on Jesus and you allow yourself to be loved and forgiven and consumed by his ways, then the Christian life becomes a delight and not a drudgery. A privilege, not a chore. Those things that I just talked about become life-giving. And so Elijah says, stop wavering. What do the people say? Nothing. Crickets. Look at verse 22. Then Elijah said, I, even I, am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. So, so, so just imagine the scene. Jezebel and Ahab have their 450 prophets of Baal. Plus we find out there are 400 other prophets of Asherah. So 850 motivated prophets on the one side of the mountain. And on the other side of the mountain was this skinny little cave dweller. Remember, he'd been on the run now for three and a half years. His beard's all scraggly. You know, he's lost a lot of weight. He's smelly. His back is sore. His skin is like leather from exposure to the extreme conditions. But he said, I'm it. Like he was God's man. He was all that remained to take up the cause of the one true God. And here's the second lesson I want you to say. See, risking it all will be a lonely place. He said, I only am left a prophet of the Lord. And I don't care how moral you are. I don't care how spiritually mature you are, how prophetic you are. 850 to one is really bad odds and it's a really lonely place. You need to know today that when you go all in with God, it's gonna leave you in the minority. It's gonna leave you in the minority with some of the jokes and shop talk at work. It's gonna leave you in the minority when it comes to the gossip and slander that kicks up among your neighbors. It's gonna leave you in the minority at the dinner table with your family and friends sometimes. Our, our cultural worldview has moved to a place that says the only value in our society is just unbridled freedom. Like the cultural norm is to say, don't let anyone tell you what, to, what you can do or believe. You, you just need to be in touch with yourself, be in touch with your inner self. Everything that's being promoted right now to you from the outside culture is considered trauma if it, if it violates anything that's inside of you. Any kind of responsibilities, any externally given identities, any accountability, any traditions that are imposed on you, any form of commitment or authority, it's all seen as an affront on your true inner self. And, and so when you try to pursue the way of Jesus in 2022 America, it feels to some like restriction. It feels to some like outside authority, like an identity is being placed on you from the outside. And it is, child of God. But when you hold that stance, guys, it's gonna get lonely. When Jesus was teaching his famous Sermon on the Mount, he talked about following him being a narrow road, and that there's a wide road that leads to destruction, but following him is a narrow road. The traditional way of reading this is that a few people are gonna go to heaven and a lot of people are gonna go to hell, but but you can also think about this, uh, the, this narrow way as being just a very specific path that gets you to life. Maybe it's less about who's in and who's out on the heaven and hell thing and more about that there's a very specific way to live your life as an apprentice of Jesus. It's narrow, meaning it's specific. It's not broad in that you can do whatever you want, that, that, that you can just be true to yourself. It's not unbridled freedom where you can just do whatever feels good in the moment, whatever brings you pleasure momentarily, where, where there are no external expectations placed on you, whatever your inner child is telling you to do. No, it's a narrow way. To, it's a narrow way to live, but it's a narrow way that leads to true life in Christ. And the section of, of scripture, like the Sermon on the Mount, become kind of this map of the narrow way. All of a sudden, the things that Jesus talks about in his sermon, like you know, forgiveness and peace and non-anxious presence and not being lustful and not being angry and not, you know, living together in community and doing the right things for the right reasons and not for show, they, they become these markers of the heart that show you that you're on the narrow road. The wide road is that you do anything that you want and don't let anybody stop you. By the way, the wide road, he says, leads to destruction. For, for the people who most strongly espouse this anything goes morality, just ask them you know, how it's going. Ask them how it's working out for them. 
Like find someone who believes that living with unbridled freedom is gonna solve everything and just ask them if they're happy. Just ask, hey, are you, are you anxious? Are you rushed? Do you feel satisfied? Are you flourishing? Are you at peace? Do you feel safe? Like we're in a society that has the lowest rates of violence in any society in human history and we're having to create safe spaces on college campuses. Why? Because this worldview of unbridled freedom is failing. You see, unbridled freedom doesn't bring peace. It brings anxiety. The narrow way of Jesus, that will bring you peace. But in our current society, when you follow that way, it will become very lonely. This is not only true today, it's always been true. And so there stands Elijah, the last man of God standing, 850 prophets and a whole nation standing against him. But Elijah proved the old adage to be true. It was quoted by social reformer Frederick Douglass who said, one and God make a majority. And guess what? Sometimes God likes to stack the odds against himself so that he can just show off. He likes to set things up so that there's no human way that it can be accomplished and then he'll go ahead and accomplish it because if people could pull it off, then people wouldn't, you know, people wouldn't need God. People would get the credit. And so God shows up and he says to the king, I'm coming to your turf. I'm coming to your entourage, to your armies, to your so-called gods, and I'm sending in my boy, Elijah. And so Elijah stands on one side, the small army of prophets on the other, and he starts laying out the ground rules. Look at verse 23. He says, two altars are going to be built, and each party is going to select a bull, and that bull will be killed and laid on each of the altars, and then prayers will be prayed to Baal and then to God by their respective prophets. Now, here's what's going to determine the winter. Look, look, look at verse 24. Elijah says, and you will call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is the God. He is the God. The God who answers by fire wins. And so they spit on their hand, they shake on the deal, and, and, and they go for it. Listen, so far today, I, I've challenged you to risk it all for God, but I wanna make sure you understand in these last couple lessons that when you do that, that he's worthy of your devotion. We're not chasing some pipe dream. This isn't a wing and a prayer, some kind of blind faith or whatever. We're, if we're risking it all, we need to know that God is trustworthy. And so here comes the third lesson from Mount Carmel. It's that false God's promise, what only the true God provides. Verse 24 says that the God who answers by fire, he is God. The prophets of Baal were thinking, you idiot Elijah, fire is our God's specialty. Do you even know who you're dealing with? This is Baal we're talking about. Baal is the sun God, hot, fire. He shoots lightning out of his hands. You're gonna get smoked, you silly little prophet. They were big talkers. They had bales who were sp responsible for rain and for the crops, for the overflow, and for the fire. These false gods promise to take care of all your needs. Oh, you can rely on us. But the false gods of this world are all talk and no action. Money promises to make you happy. Success promises to satisfy you. That boyfriend or girlfriend or that spouse promises to fill the void in your life. And as we just talked about, unbridled freedom promises to give you pleasure upon pleasure. But in the end, they lead to anxiety and emptiness. Did you know that there's a thing called a happiness index? Did you know that the US is about 15th on that list, by the way, of all countries in the world? But the interesting thing is that the happiness in the United States started to decline every year starting in the 1960s, ironically coinciding with the rise of this secular progressive vision of unbridled freedom. False gods aren't going to get you to true purpose and meaning. Only the true God is faithful and gracious and generous and long-suffering and merciful and just. Only God alone can fulfill the spiritual void in your life. Only God provides. But for now, at the top of the mountain, he sits back and he waits for Baal to go first. And so Elijah says, we have two altars. We have two bulls. The stage is set. Now, the God who makes fire fall from heaven is the winner. And he says to the Baal guys, you go first. We'll let the Bible describe the play-by-play -play in verse 26. It says, they call upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they limped around the altar that they had just made. And in verse 27, it says, Elijah starts mocking them. I love this. I, I, I picture Elijah just laying back in his lawn chair watching all this. He's got his shades on. He's got a dirty tank top. 
He's smoking a big stogie. He's a Hebrew prophet, so he's got a big old Duck Dynasty beard going, and he starts smack talking. And there's a purpose in his sarcasm. Elijah is trying to show people how ridiculous it is to give yourself to a God who's not real. And so he says, hey, maybe your, maybe your God is in deep thought and he can't hear you. He says, maybe he took a little trip. He'll be back soon, but you better keep dancing and shouting. You wouldn't want to miss him if he does walk in the door. Or he says, maybe he's asleep, just took a little cat nap. Maybe the notifications on his phone accidentally got turned off. Here's my favorite one. He says in verse 27, he says, maybe he's relieving himself. <laughs> maybe he's on the pot. Maybe your God is a little backed up. And so you better scream nice and loud to be sure he sets down his iPad and he pays attention to you from the toilet. Well, it turns out that the prophets of Baal don't have much of a sense of humor. They take Elijah quite seriously, and they decide that they do need to try harder to get Baal's attention. And so they begin to cut themselves until blood is gushing out, and they keep dancing around. And verse 28 says this. It says, and they raved un uh, until the time of the offering of the oblation, but there was no voice. And before you start accusing these ancient, you know, uneducated people of being crazy, Guys, some of you do the same thing. In fact, you don't dance for your false gods all day. Some of you do it for a whole lifetime. Dancing and praising and pursuing and serving and striving toward these false gods that promise but never deliver. Where is it that you're doing the dance? Calling on someone or something to answer your call. There are many people today punishing themselves with fear and anxiety. Yes, cutting, eating disorders, trying to find something that will fill the void. Working endless hours, two or three jobs, trying to make extra money while cutting away at the health of their marriage or their own soul. Doing the dance of endless pleasure seeking while compromising their integrity, their moral core. Jesus says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? Nothing, he says. It gains him nothing is the point. Well, back to the mountain, the prophets of Baal have mutilated themselves with no results. And so now it's Elijah's turn. No pressure. 850 to 1. The king, the queen, the multitudes of people saying, look, Elijah, you created the contest. You put the big dare out there. So let's see some action from your side. There's nowhere to run now, there's nowhere to hide, just tension-filled anticipation. Either God's gonna come through or not. This is the moment. The, the, the God who provided the ravens, the God who provided the widow at Zarephath, the one who refilled the jars of flour and oil, the one who brought the boy back to life, the one who protected Elijah when he was confronting Ahab and was called the troubler of Israel. All of those moments where God came through were leading to this very moment and now God is on the hook. And I'm gonna paraphrase from verse 30 onward. But Elijah asked the people to gather in real close. It's his turn. So he says, come in real close. And so they all move in and they all quiet down. And Elijah starts grabbing 12 stones to build his altar, 12 stones representing the tribes of Israel. Now remember, the country is divided now, 10 tribes in the north, two in the south, but he's painting this picture here. And I imagine, this is just my imagination, but he puts one stone in place and then a second and he starts narrating. He starts saying, surely you remember the 12 tribes of Israel. Surely you remember that the, that the true God made a loving commitment to you, his people. He said that he would love you and that if you would return that love with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, not only would he bless you, but someday he would bless the whole world through you and he takes the third stone and then the fourth. And as they watch, they're slowly being reminded of God's love, of God's faithfulness to them. In his love, he says, he brought us out of the land of Egypt where we were slaves. He gave us this promised land. Surely you remember the parting of the Red Sea. Surely you remember the Jordan River and the manna from heaven and the quail and the water from the rock. Surely you remember how lovingly God delivered us and treated us and, and all the promises he kept to us. Surely you remember how faithful he's been. And while Elijah's putting stones 10 and 11 and 12 into place, he just shakes his head and he says, and now you're actually considering turning away from the loving promise-making, promise-keeping, faithful God in order to worship this other guy, this Baal, who's not even real. He never told you he loves you. He never made a commitment to you. He never made a covenant and kept it. He hasn't been faithful to you. You did this whole performance today and you can't even get him to answer you. Why are you doing this? And as he puts the 12th stone in place, I imagine him saying, but your God wants you back. And so he builds 
the altar and then he makes a trench around the altar and he lays down some wood and then he places the bull, the sacrifice on top. And just to make it interesting, he commands people to fill four buckets with water. Now, now remember how scarce water was after three and a half years of drought. Like if you want a sign that Elijah's risking it all, if he's pushing his chips in, look no further than the four buckets of water. And so they soaked everything, the bull, the wood, and enough that the water ran off and filled the trench all around the altar. You see what he's doing? He, he, he's, he's stacking the odds against God. This is one of those, my God can beat up your God with both hands behind his back kind of move. And, and we're about to have our fire fall moment. The altar is ready, but more importantly, remember, Elijah's ready. He, he's gone through years of preparation to get ready for this moment. He learned dependency. He learned faith. He learned obedience. And they, they've all brought him to this moment where he could be so bold right now. And now he does the only thing that makes sense. With such high stakes, he prays. Look at verse 36. He says, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. You know, I think this prayer points us to a very important lesson, a fourth lesson. It's that the true God only needs to be approached, not impressed. Elijah doesn't do all the dancing. He doesn't do all the slashing. He just prays in a normal voice, in normal tones, no fancy words. He just talks to God. And, and notice his motivation. He doesn't say, answer me, God, so that I'll win. He doesn't say, answer me, God, so that I can start getting some respect around here or so that I can be vindicated or so that I can finally stop running and move out of my cave and into the palace. No, he says, please, God, send fire today so that people will know that you are God. That's the dream. Guys, that's our dream, too. You, you know, I've been at Grace for almost 30 years, and I'm so thankful for God's faithfulness here. I really am. And at this stage of things, to be honest, I, I'm, I'm weary of the ambition. I'm weary of the striving. We, we don't need to be larger in size. We don't need notoriety. Do you know what the cry of my heart is? What the cry of our leaders and staff is? Is that you would truly know the power of the one true God. That, that people all over our region would know that a true encounter with God will give you access to the power of the cross, to the power of the resurrection, to the power to, to walk in peace and forgiveness and confidence and bold obedience. There's nothing like it. But you don't have to impress him with all kinds of spiritual gymnastics. You don't have to put on a show and get all cleaned up first and stop swearing so much and stop smoking so much, stop sleeping around so much. Whatever you think it is that you have to do to impress him. He doesn't need to be impressed. He needs to be approached. He says, come to me. And so we just come to him. You come to him. You come to him as you are. And after this desperate and beautiful prayer, I want you to look at verse 38, the moment we've been waiting for. It says, for then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench and when all the people saw it, listen, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. So God's power falls and it burns up everything, the bull, the wood, the stones, the dust, even the water in the trench is just, whoosh, it's gone. I, I just, can you imagine being there for that? You know how, how hot a fire has to be to destroy stone? Like the people not only saw it, they felt it. You remember what I said two weeks ago that Elijah's name meant? Uh, Elijah's name means the Lord is God. And so what are the people chanting at the end? They're chanting the Lord is God. They're, they're probably chanting Elijah's name, Elijah, Elijah. But it wasn't about him. It was about the one he was named after and the one his whole life has been pointing to all along. And just look at the people's response. We can see it wasn't about Elijah. When the fire falls, they simply fall to their faces with it and they acknowledge the greatness of God. No dancing, no slashing, no fanfare, just repentance. The other God said, dance for me, slash for me. There, there's only one God. Guys, listen, there was only one God who was slashed for you. Every other God will make your blood run. Only the one true God is the one who did the bleeding. And the reflex response of witnessing the unlimited power of God is just to fall on your face and start telling the truth. That the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And if Elijah were here today, he would probably confront some of you with the same question he asked the Israelites. How long will you waver? 
Why are you straddling a commitment between a loving God and an empty world? I've been praying, guys, that a spiritual renewal would sweep all across our church this month. Seeing what God has done at our worship nights has been incredible. And I pray that that would continue. But I wanna challenge some of you today to risk it all for God. He's not an item on a menu of many options. He's not a backup plan. He's not some vice principal in the sky waiting to smack your hand. He's not Ned Flanders. He's not nervous. He's not having panic attacks when he watches CNN. He's amazing and he's powerful and he's loving and he's gracious and he's forgiving and he gave his son so that you might live your life to the full. How long will you waver? If the Lord is God, then he deserves everything. If the Lord is God, we must bring him everything our time and our talents and our treasures and lay them at his feet and say, use me. If the Lord is God, we must praise him like we win. He says, no need to impress me. Just approach me and see what I might do. And if that's you today, if Elijah's story has reminded you of your own need for spiritual renewal, I'm gonna invite you today as your host comes to respond to his power. I love you guys.